Okay, so let me do reflexes and then I'm done for today with you guys. You can look at phones or whatever you want to do. Okay, this will take about an hour. No, <laughs> I don't want that. I don't take that. All right, uh, but it is heavy though, so I'll go slow with you for this. All right, reflexes. Okay, uh, there's different types of reflexes. We have a spinal reflex, and basically it's going to take place in a spinal cord. All right, doesn't need to go up to the brain, as I showed you before. Um, it's going to come, you, something's going to happen to a certain part of your body. The neuron's going to go into the spinal cord, synapse with something, and go right through as a motor neuron going back to that area to, reflect, to do some kind of response, whether blinking or moving the leg, whatever it is does not need to go up to the brain to get integrated and processed. This allows things, reflexes, to happen much quicker. Okay? A reflex arc, we have parts of it going on here. Sensory receptor, the sensory neuron, the integrate. So you have the receptor, something's going to touch something out there, on the knee, so to say. The sensory neuron is then going to send from the information from the receptor to the integrating center, which is going to be the, um, the central nervous system, in our case, the spinal cord. It's then going to synapse with a motor neuron in the spinal cord and send it out to whatever organ it's going to go to to contract, be infected. All right? So a needle goes in here, a thumbtack goes in here, there's the receptors, there's the neuron that goes this way. When it gets into the spinal cord, it's then going to integrate whether we're going to uh, have an interneuron here. Sometimes we won't have an interneuron, but it's going to then go into the motor aspect and go through that muscle, the infector, to um, contract. Okay? So it stays within the spinal cord. Types of reflexes monosynaptic, meaning there's only one synapse there, two neurons. A good example of that is the stretch reflex. I'm going to draw you a picture so you can see it. A polysynaptic reflex, more or withdrawal reflex, and a cross extensor reflex. We'll talk about those. You do this all the time. When I show you my examples, it'll come back to you. Okay? So let's talk about the monosynaptic reflex. And the stretch or the patella or the knee reflex is a good example of this. Okay? So the stretch reflex, it's a protective measure to prevent the muscle or the tendon from tearing. And how does it do it? It causes that muscle to contract. To contract. It's preventing the muscle to, to, or the tendon to tear by contracting that muscle. So a good example is a patellar reflex, the knee reflex. So let me show you what I mean. Here's we're doing a side view. This is going to be our patella. And we have a muscle up here. So your femur's up here, your patella's down here, and then you have like your tibia down here, so to say. And your femur's up here. Your femur, tibia. So you're sitting down, right? And we have a muscle kind of goes like this. Somehow it goes like this. Okay? And what you're going to do is you're going to take a hammer. Let me just draw it like this because it's, it's easier for you to visualize. You have the patella here, and then you have this tendon that goes here. You're going to have this hammer, and the hammer is usually like a mallet. It looks like a looks like this, and then I don't know, a little hammer over here, but handle here. You're going to take this hammer, and you're going to, and this is the tendon. You're going to tap it, right? You you've had that done before, right? You tap it. Here. And what's going to happen is, it doesn't realize this, but what happens is 
this tendon, and I'm going to exaggerate it in my picture, is going to get stretched. If I press here, it's going to stretch, and I'm exaggerating it, like that. Does that make sense? You're stretching that. It's called a stretch reflex. Okay. Now, the body doesn't realize that it's just a tap. The body realizes that you are stretching that. So I don't know if you're going to just do it that one time and move away, or are you going to continuously push on that, and then it's going to be tearing. So it's expecting the worst. It's expecting that you're going to tear that muscle or that tendon. So what happens is you have this reflex that goes on. To prevent that from tearing, it's going to make this muscle contract. And when it contracts, it's going to kick up your leg. It thinks you're going to tear it. It's not, though. It's just a tap. But it's a reflex. It doesn't go up to the brain to get processed. It goes right into the spinal cord, and that's all it does. Okay. So that's what's happening. It's preventing your tearing of your muscle or your tendon by contracting. And this is the stretch reflex. Okay? So the steps of this is that the stimulus activates the receptor, okay, by tapping on it. The sensory neuron gets it activated. Processing occurs in the central nervous system. In this case, the spinal cord. It doesn't go up to your brain. Central nervous system is the brain and spinal cord, so we say in the spinal cord, okay? And then the motor neuron gets activated and goes to the effector and contracts that muscle, okay? So you tap over here, and where it's going to sense this being stretched is right here in the muscle, all right? It's not in the tendon. It's actually in the muscle, the receptor. It feels the tension. Somehow it goes through here and feels the tension up here. And what's going to happen is it's going to send it to the spinal cord. The spinal cord is then going to connect it, and then you're going to be able to go back to the muscle and contract it. Okay? So this is a muscle spindle reflex, meaning that the receptors are in the muscle. It's surrounded by the skeletal muscle. Okay? responds by stretching the muscle, by stretching it this way. That's what, so this senses the stretch and prevents that muscle or tendon from tearing and it's gonna contract, all right? And it'll contract very quickly. This happens all on the same side, ipsilateral, okay? Example, think of whiplash. You're driving 60 miles per hour and then you slam on the brake. Your head is still going 60 miles per hour, right? So now what's happening is your head is going forward. It's feeling a stretch back here. So it's a reflex. It's going to kick back your head. That's whiplash. Okay, it's a reflex that happens there. Ballistic exercise creates stronger contractions. The best way I can explain this one, I remember doing this in sixth grade with basketball practicing. Um, and I think you've got, if, if you've done basketball before, I mean, regular basketball where you're working with a team and stuff, they make you do all these crazy suicides going back and forth. You, if you know, you know what I'm talking about. They were hard on us. But this is one thing I remember. To create us to have a stronger jump to get that slam dunk up there, they had us go jump from a box. So let's say the tabletop here. And they had us jump from here as high as we could. And when we landed, we had to land in cannonball position. And as soon as we, so we went into cannonball position up here, someplace up here, and land that way. And as soon as our feet touch the ground, we have to spread our legs. We have to extend our legs and see the next jump we can do. And what happens here is that when you do this, you're actually stretching your legs. You're stretching your quads. You're putting, when you land on there, you're stretching your quads. And that's going to create a kicking sensation. 
So now what's happening is that you're using what you normally would do to jump, you're using your regular muscles, but you're also going to amplify it by having the reflex, like you're piggybacking off the reflex, and it's going to give you a stronger jump. The reflex will allow your, your, um, your, your legs to extend but you're going to extend them anyway because you're forcing yourself. You're consciously going to extend your legs, but subconsciously or unconsciously, your reflexes are also going to stretch it. So it's going to create a stronger or a higher jump. Does that make sense? Can you visualize that? That's the only one I could really think of. All these are like, I just want to go home. <laughs> right. You don't want to try this at home, no? All right. Well, that's what it is. Maybe you'll watch it again or maybe we'll find something on YouTube. But that's what that is. You get this bigger jump, this stronger contraction. Another way you can do this is take your arm and if I actually go like this, abducting and adducting my arm really fast for 25 times. Now, if I do this really slow one time and you mark how far I could bring my arm and put a mark there, and then I do it 25 times fast, I can't bring it back to that same position because there's going to be a stretch over here that gets to a certain point and says, uh-uh, we're not going to let you stretch that far, and it kicks it back this way. So I lose my range of motion. Does that make sense? Okay, so that's what I meant over here. A, B, and A, B, duction, and A, D, duction, your arms 25 times quickly is going to decrease your ROM, range of motion because it's gonna kick back. It feels that stretch. So it doesn't know how far you're going to put it there so fast. They don't want, the, your body does not want your tendons to stretch and tear. So this is a, a precaution measure to make sure that your tendons and muscles don't tear by contracting. Is that clear about that? It's a mechanism that's going to cause contraction to prevent you from tearing. Okay, and it's just showing you the receptors are in the skeletal muscle themselves. All right, um, I got to put these slides out. I think it's a little bit, it's basically you're putting a weight over here, another weight, it kicks up. So every time you put more weights on here, your, your arm is kicking back up. All right, I, I, you can read that. If that works for some of you, um, it worked for me for a little bit, but then I got confused with it. And, whether you want to use that or not. All right, now polysynaptic reflex, okay? We have something called a Golgi tendon organ reflex. It's not the same thing as a Golgi apparatus. I don't even think it's the same guy that discovered it. Now, this is also a protective measure from t for tearing your muscle or tendon, but it does a different, it has a different result. This is going to prevent your muscle or tendon from tearing by relaxing your muscle. Not contracting like I just showed you, but relaxing your muscle. Okay? So it's going to deal with an ipsilateral reflex is a good example. And I'll show you that withdrawal versus contralateral. Let me show you what I mean by this. Alright, the Golgi tendon reflex. This is the receptors here are actually in the tendon. That kind of is inferred by the name. Okay? So the receptors are on the tendon themselves. And it responds to too much tension and prevents the muscle from tearing by relaxing. All right. Good example of this is overstretching a muscle. Okay. If I take, that's why they want you to stretch before you run. Okay. When you take your arm, I used to do discus when I was in high school. And what they had us do is take your arm like this and stretch it like this very slowly. Okay, it feels the tension. Now, if I do that again and go this way, I could probably go a little bit further because it feels the tension and it relaxes the muscle. It says, whoa, you're going to tear that. So what we're gonna do is relax the muscle so you can go a little bit further, if that's what your intention is, and you won't tear the muscle. Does that make sense? It gives you more of a range of motion. Okay, a stiff neck. What happens here, you sleep like this. So this area is being stretched slowly, not a quick thing. It was a slow stretch throughout your sleep, and you're like this. 
So this muscle gets all relaxed because it feels it being stretched that way. This muscle tends to contract more. You have this muscle contracting for a long amount of time. When you wake up, it's so sore because it's been contracted for so long. And it, this side allowed you to contract it even further. That's why you have a, a stiff neck. Does that make sense? Okay. Like I just said before, if I do this very quickly, you're not gonna you're gonna lose your range of motion. But if I do it very slowly, abducting my arm very slowly, and measure where I am over here, and then do it again very slowly, it feels the, the, the stretch there and it allows you to go even further. Because it doesn't want you to tear this. Okay? So we have two mechanisms going on to prevent your tendon or muscle from tearing. We have a reflex that causes contraction, which we could understand that. But we also have reflexes, when it's done slowly, that it's going to relax that muscle. Okay? Does that make sense to you guys? Yeah? Okay? So it's just showing you over here where it's being stretched. So I'll, um, you can do that on your own when you look at that. Okay? Um, and like I said, the receptors for this is going to be located in the tendon. The Golgi tendon reflex, organ reflex, okay? And it gets to a point, and I'm trying to show you on this, you put more and more weights, eventually it feels the, the stretch on there and it just gives because it's just going to relax the muscles over here because there's just too much weight. So it's just not going to tear. All right? Now, two more things and I'm done. Okay? These are easy to manage even though they have crazy names. These are easier to manage. The flexor withdrawal reflex. You do this all the time. Okay? This is more um, move of the affected body part away from a stimulus. The most common stimulus there, or most, it's the easiest, the easiest stimulus for you to understand is pain. Okay? So the strongest is going to be pain stimuli. What's going to happen here is a few things. Let's say you touch a hot frying pan. The reflex is that, okay? That's what this is, a flexor or withdrawal reflex. And what happens here is the hot frying pan stimulate the pain receptors in your hand. Sensor neurons will activate the interneurons in the spinal cord. You got some interneurons that'll, that'll actually, in the anterior horn, and it's going to flex the muscles. You think about it. Every time you touch something painful, think about what your hand, what your leg is doing. They all flex. Everything flexes. My, my shoulder flexes, my elbow flexes, my wrist flexes, my fingers flex. It's a reflex that causes, maybe that's the reason why they call it reflex, but, um, but it flexes everything. Does it extend everything? It reflexes. A withdrawal okay and we also have other things oh here I'll show you the picture all right you touch something hot over here goes inside all right part of it's gonna go up to your brain because yeah you're gonna remember there's a, there's a little delay it's like stubbing your toe you stub your toe there's a delay before the pain gets to you know it's like oh here comes the pain <laughs> there it is okay there you know your brain has to process it but your foot will kick back faster than your brain can process it. Does that make sense? Okay. Same thing when you touch a frying pan. You kicked your hand back and thought about, that was hot, right? You say it afterwards. You don't say, it. that was hot, and then move your hand, right? You know what I'm saying. So it does go up to your brain eventually, okay? But I'm talking about the reflex. When the reflex happens, it goes to the, to the anterior horn. There's going to be two things that's coming out of the anterior horn. One, it's going to stimulate the flexors. It's going to stimulate your biceps over here. But you have to have something else go on to your triceps. It has to also inhibit the extensors. You can't have both of these contracted at the same time. It's going to stay there. So you need a reflex that is going to stimulate the flexors, but it's going to inhibit the extensors on that same side. Okay? 
This is all the stuff that you just take for granted. And that's why I said this class is going to be a manual about yourself. Why do you do these stupid, ludicrous things? It's because of the way the body is put together. Now you have this cross extensor reflex. Let me just tell you, this is probably the most complex, but it's also the easiest to manage because everybody can relate to it. Okay? Stepping on a tack is probably a good example of this. Now look what's going to happen here. On my right side, let me what I have here. So here, on my right side, I'm going my right foot, I'm stepping on a tack here. Okay? What's going to happen is I'm going to have the flexor withdrawal reflex happen on the right leg. It's going to go like that. Flexors are just going to kick on. You step on something, hurts, it's going to kick up. Flexors are all kicking on here. My right leg, flexors are stimulated, extensors are inhibited. Right? That makes sense. But we have a problem, Houston, because our weight was put on two legs. So as soon as you flex the right leg, your whole body would collapse because 50% of your weight is not going to be held by anything. Does that make sense? So we have to make sure that we can actually cross to the other side and do something to the other leg. So the flexor is going to be happening on the one side, right? Flexor reflex pulls the injured foot away on the ipsilateral side. The flexor muscles will be stimulated. The extensor muscles will be inhibited. But on the other side, we have the cross extensor reflex. It's going to do the opposite because it has to counteract that balance. That weight has to be distributed now all on the other side. So the uninjured leg supports shifting weight via contralateral. So what's going to happen? And think about it. You're not going to flex your other leg. You step on a thumbtack with your right leg, you're going to flex both. You can't flex both legs. You'll fall on the floor. Right? So what happens, and think about it. It does it automatically. Your right leg is going to flex. It's going to turn off the withdrawal muscles. I'm sorry, the um, extensor muscles of your right leg. It's going to stimulate the flexor muscles of your leg, right leg. On the other leg, it's going to stimulate the extensors of your left leg. It's going to inhibit the flexors of your left leg. It does the opposite to put the balance on there. Okay? So, again, he steps on a piece of glass or whatever, and it's showing you that there's going to be crossing over to the other side so that the weight can be bared on the other side. It's the most complex... But I think it's the easiest to manage because you just think about what's happening. Okay?